our first in-person seminar at the Cary Institute since March 2020. And uh, we have sorry, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. There's 11 of us here in person and, uh, and about 27 virtual. So, so now we're gonna do a, hi a hybrid seminar and we'll see how it turns out. So, and I'm just delighted to welcome Monica Palta, who many of you know, cause she's been here before. Um, I've known Monica for a long time. She has a bachelor's degree from Grinnell College and then a master's degree from the University of Georgia, which is where I first met. So yeah, it was a long time ago. Mm -hmm. uh, and then um, she got a, uh, came to and got a PhD at Rutgers. Um, and I was on Monica's committee and, uh, and she did work in urban wetlands. And, um, and, so, and so it's a really interesting mixture of things that Monica, Monica does. Um, but wait, let me, let me finish before I talk about the, the urban stuff. So she got a PhD at Rutgers. Uh, she was a postdoc at Arizona State uh, and is now a professor at Pace University based in New York City. And what's the department there? Uh, environmental studies and science. Environmental studies, and so so Monica is is um, is an urban urban biogeochemist, and and her, and her dissertation work started out with studies of denitrification in urban wetlands, and like I like to think that I work with urban urban <laughs> urban ecosystems and urban soils, but but Monica was really pushing the frontiers okay. with this work at Rutgers, with um, soils you know really heavily infected by uh, industrial activity soils next to the New Jersey Turnpike. I don't know if we're gonna see some of these pictures yep. of these mm -hmm. sites, but they're really, really deeply urban sites. And so the work was really fundamental at demonstrating that there is an active biogeochemistry in these urban sites. And, and the results are, are, are quite interesting and, and, and generate quite a bit of attention. And at Arizona State, um, Monica continued that work and kind of dis discovered and, and started this whole idea of accidental wetlands. And so as we wander around in cities, we see that there are wetlands. Um, in surprising places because we're always moving water around in cities. And, and, um, and so she's, she's got a whole area of research on, on accidental wetlands and, and the, the, the ecological functions that they perform, but then also the social functions. And so her, and her work kind of expanded very nicely into a social ecological approach to urban, urban systems and urban wetlands. And she's continued that quite a bit in the work that she's doing at PACE, as you can, as you can see over here. Uh, just one other thing to say about Monica's work is um, is really pushing the frontiers with 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 urbanization, but not but using really state of the art methods. And so when she was measuring uh, denitrification in urban wetlands, she was using a membrane inlet mass spectrometer, and she was making lots of field measurements and 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 kind of doing detailed chemistry. So a really interesting mix of of, of strong conceptual approach, but then state of the art biogeochemistry. And so I, I'm looking forward to the talk. And, and here we go. Thanks so much, Peter. Um, you basically outlined my talk. Um, so I'm going to talk today, um, as Peter said, about urban wetlands and waterways and um, uh, give an overview of my past work and uh, take you into the present and future work that I'm doing. Um, so to introduce the idea of people and water, um, obviously very complicated relationship. Um, so the earliest cities that we, find, that we found on earth um, were of course developed on floodplain ecosystems um, like Mesopotamia, um, uh, which arose in the Fertile Crescent. Um, and you know that that um, has that trend has continued throughout the world, where we see um, development of cities and these large uh, human habitations around uh, in and around wetland areas. Um, so obviously, New York City was a giant marsh before it became New York City. And uh, you know the waterways around it uh, made it ideal for trade. Um, there are a lot of livelihoods and um, food and water supplies that are provided by being near waterways and um, being near especially freshwater wetlands. Um, so there are a lot of those benefits that draw people to uh, wetland environments and to um, areas near waterways. But of course, um, through our use and development of those environments, uh, we also run into a lot of problems. Um, so uh, we of course have problems like, uh, you know, major hurricanes, sea level rise. Um, we have uh, problems with both legacy and current pollution um, that we are disposing of into nearby waterways. Um, and then there are a number of, um, those problems that intersect with uh, socioeconomic concerns that we have um, with very vulnerable populations, um, 
vulnerable in many different ways because of sea level rise, pollution, and poverty. So um, in addition to that, uh, so in addition to our past and uh, present uh, connection with waterways and with wetlands, um, we know that future development is of, of cities is going to also take place predominantly in coastal areas and predominantly um, in wetland areas. So if we look at this map um, of the US over here, uh, demonstrating wetland density, you'll notice that the projected urban growth in 2050 coincides with where we find the darkest green patches in the landscape. Um, so this is not only a problem that we've had to navigate in the past and um, that we are currently navigating in the present, but it's going to be something that we have to plan for in the future. Um, so uh, my work really uh, gets into how can we um, more sustainably, uh, how can we generate more sustainable relationships between uh, people in waterways, people in wetlands um, in the face of this uh, massive future urban development in these areas that we're anticipating. So the reason that people move into um, wetland areas and waterways, as I alluded bef to before, is that urban wetlands provide a lot of ecosystem services or uh, benefits to people. So um, there's obviously habitat for wildlife that's provided by these environments. Um, the vegetation through transpiration and shading um, cools an area a great deal. Um, there's a lot of water storage and dissipation of water energy that wetlands can provide. And they are also really good at processing pollutants. So sequestering carbon, uh, removing or storing contaminants um, and so forth. And then there are of course, a number of social uses as well. Uh, wetlands provide a lot of recreational opportunities and aesthetic values. Um, for this reason, uh, because of the massive wetland loss, um, and also the many services that wetlands could potentially provide, especially in terms of sea level rise and mitigating flooding. Um, New York City has a number of uh, proposed wetland projects, either to create wetlands um, basically from scratch or um, restore former wetland areas. So this is in um, Manhattan. This is in uh, Coney Island Creek over here. And um, these projects are, uh, kind of ongoing or slated to happen in the near future um, to ideally provide some of these services that we um, have lost through our elimination of wetland habitats. New York City has lost uh, somewhere between 80 and 95% of the wetlands that were originally there. So uh, quite depleted. All right, so to just introduce you to the kind of framework that I have been using for my research over the past decade, um, I'm really looking at a lot of these stressors that I was mentioning in the previous slide. So poverty and health issues, uh, nutrient and pathogen loading and climate change and how they collectively impact urban waterways and the people utilizing them. Of course, urban waterways and the people utilizing them also have strong feedbacks to all of these things. Um, so humans generate waste. They, um, you know, there are intersections with uh, climate change and urbanization um, and poverty and health issues that I will be talking about. And then um, I use um, urban wetlands through their, the structures and functions that they have, the unique structures and functions, um, to see if uh, a more beneficial relationship uh, between urban waterways and people can be generated through the services that urban wetlands provide. So urban wetlands are almost a, um, could serve as a potential buffering force uh, between people and these stressors that we find in the urban environment because they are able to provide benefits. That being said, however, uh, we do have to, uh, in our consideration of services, take into account potential disservices that are associated with wetlands. Uh, wetlands are not uniformly positive, no environment is. Um, there are some potential harms or um, downsides uh, that we have to consider if we are going to evaluate what the net benefit of restoring, creating, um, or conserving wetlands in, ur in urban areas is. Um, and then finally, um, if we have a better sense of what services and disservices are being provided by urban wetlands um, to urban waterways and people, 
um, we have a better framework for making decisions about management design and policy. Um, and I've also used a lot of, um, of uh, different kinds of decision making to classify and study different urban wetlands, um, like the accidental wetlands that I'll be talking about in just a moment. So um, my talk um, is really going to be a tale of two metro regions. Um, the title of my talk was borrowed off of an um, episode of Sex in the City. Um, and I guess I got carried away with my um, cultural references and decided to throw in another one. So this is going to be a tale of two, not cities, but um, very large metro regions uh, in Phoenix, Arizona, and in New York. Um, some Jersey people might bristle at Northern New Jersey being characterized as the metro New York City region, but um, we'll just run with it. So I'm going to be um, going through a couple of different uh, themes when I talk about the wetlands in these metro regions. Uh, one is I'm going to cover how gradients of intervention affect wetland function. Um, I'll be talking a lot about wetland ecosystem services and disservices, as I mentioned in the previous slide. And then um, I'll move into um, some more recent work that I've been doing, uh, looking at wetlands and social ecological resilience to climate change. Um, so I'm going to start out uh, by talking about um, how decision making, how management design and policy in cities um, can influence the nature um, and function of urban wetlands. So wetlands are delineated in uh, using three different metrics. The first being hydrology. Obviously they're called wetlands, so there needs to be water there in order for them to be a wetland. So the presence of standing water is the first criteria, criterion. Um, with standing water comes unique soil properties, hydric soils, and plants that are more tolerant to being flooded for the majority of the year. And so collectively, the presence of hydrology, wetland soils, and wetland plants is what delineates an area as a wetland. So here are a couple of different uh, types of wetlands that uh, you may see around New York City. Um, Pelham Bay in the Bronx is a remnant marsh system, so this was an area that was conserved. Um, it's been very slightly restored in some areas, but for the most part, this was an intact marsh that pre-existed human development. Um, there are also a number of uh, restoration projects uh, that vary in terms of how much was there before the restoration started. Sometimes it was just a question of planting more marsh grass. Um, sometimes uh, this area was almost completely bare soil. Maybe the standing water was there, but um, not really the wetland plants. So um, all of these wetlands, and then of course we have uh, proposed wetlands again that are going to be uh, supposedly built from scratch by building the land out from Manhattan and, and making these wetland environments. So all of these uh, wetlands do have the criteria that I was talking about before. They have standing water, uh, hydric soils and wetland plants. And when humans intervene on the landscape or they delineate a wetland, um, those are the sort of metrics that they are trying to rebuild in a particular area or conserve in a particular area. Okay, so that's uh, remnant, restored, and constructed wetlands, um, those examples that I just showed you. But what are accidental wetlands? Um, well, accidental wetlands are these wetland environments that form uh, unintentionally, as the name suggests, um, in typically in low-lying parts of the landscape where you have um, somewhat compacted soils, which impedes drainage. And so you have this kind of perched uh, standing water situation on top of the soil profile. And because uh, there is standing water sustained in the environment, again, I said hydrology is the first criterion that we use to make a wetland. Uh, we have to have water. And with that comes the soils and vegetation. So these uh, systems really kind of self-organize ecologically um, into wetland environments. Um, so they have all the characteristics to delineate them as wetlands. Um, they are novel ecosystems um, because the soils that at these sites um, are uniquely urban, as I'll go into in more detail. Um, the hydrology reflects urban hydrology and the plants are often a mix of you know, botanicals, um, invasive species and, and so forth, but they are wetland plants. Um, so they are not uh, designed or managed in any kind of way typically, but they do result from human activity. And so these are man-made wetlands 
but they were not intentionally made. And um, because of this, um, I was very interested in looking at uh, how pervasive these environments were in the landscape. Um, do we find them in many cities? And what kind of functions do they have? And so uh, a driving uh, question, and especially in my PhD uh, research, was are accidental wetlands functionally similar to native or constructive wetlands? They have all the same structural aspects. Do they have the same functional aspects? Um, so uh, one of the main things that I was studying in terms of whether uh, these accidental wetlands were functionally similar to constructed uh, wetlands or restored wetlands or remnant wetlands um, was the issue of nitrogen removal. So nitrogen removal is a really critical uh, function that wetlands can provide in uh, cities because cities have a lot of nitrogen pollution. There are many different sources of nitrogen um, in New York, uh, so, uh, the septic systems and sewage uh, treatment system or lack thereof um, is a big source of nitrogen. Uh, fossil fuel combustion, fertilizers and um, leaves from street trees can all be potential sources. So there's typically a lot of nitrogen um, in the urban environment that goes into waterways. When it does go into waterways, it can cause eutrophication, which is this excessive algal bloom, which when it decomposes, um, uses up oxygen in the water profile and can lead to mass die off of wildlife that relies on the oxygen in the water profile. Um, these pictures are actually from Jamaica Bay in New York City. Um, so this eutrophication problem is uh, you know, not unique to New York, but we definitely are um, seeing increased concern about this happening in New York City waterways. Uh, so why do wetlands help with this? Um, well, wetlands, again, because of the presence of standing water, um, support a very low oxygen environment in the sediments. And the low oxygen environment um, leads to um, this process of denitrification, uh, where biologically reactive nitrogen in the form of nitrate is converted into um, nitrogen gas by uh, facultative anaerobic bacteria. Um, and because wetlands uh, are often situated at the interface of waterways and upland areas, they can kind of serve to intercept stormwater um, as it is uh, traveling to the waterway and ideally remove the nitrogen as it does. Um, you may already see a potential problem here though. Um, so denitrification, um, if it runs to completion, um, results in dinitrogen gas, which is fairly inert. It makes up 80% of our atmosphere. Um, it's, not, uh, it, it's a very ideal way of making a reactive form of nitrogen into a non-reactive form. But um, denitrification in the presence of some oxygen um, can also result in nitrous oxide or in CO2 gas, both of which are greenhouse gases. So even though um, there is this benefit, this ecosystem service that's provided by wetlands of nitrogen removal, um, you can already maybe see some of the associated disservices that could potentially result from this process. All right, so uh, for my PhD work, um, as Peter mentioned, I uh, found some accidental wetlands in New Jersey that I was studying um, specifically to look at uh, whether they were capable of supporting denitrification and what some of the driving factors were. Um, so this top site is Liberty State Park um, in Jersey City, New Jersey, uh, used to be a uh, railroad station and then was abandoned in the mid middle of the 20th century. Um, this is in Teaneck, New Jersey. This is a site that's right next to the um, New Jersey Turnpike, which you can see over here. Um, and this was basically a, a mixed use kind of environment, um, but it was a dumping ground for turnpike construction and um, a landfill at one point. So very heavily um, modified in the landscape here. Um, this was also, the site was also abandoned and fenced off um, in the mid 20th century. And so in the interim, um, because uh, they were low lying in the landscape um, compared to the surrounding upland urbanized landscape, um, stormwater entered the site, uh, both surface water and rainwater uh, pooled up on the soil profiles and created these uh, accidental wetland environments. Um, so this is uh, 
what the soil profile looks like in um, the TNAC site. Um, it's a, a very, very odd soil, soil profile. Um, so underlying the site is this native um, wetland clay soil. And then on top of it are these piles of fill debris and garbage. Um, they kind of look like this. And um, in lower lying parts of the landscape, uh, where you've had runoff from the fill piles, um, you have sort of a mix of uh, partially decomposed organic material because there's standing water almost all the time um, that impedes, uh, that impedes uh, decomposition. Um, and then uh, some fill mixed in that's runoff of the fill piles. And there are areas of the, uh, the TNX site that have exposed clay. Um, there are areas that have these fill piles and then there are areas of um, this sort of high organic material uh, mix of fill and plant material kind of thing. Um, so when I was doing my work on the site, I was expecting that the native clay soils were probably going to support the highest rates of denitrification. Um, and uh, this was kind of based on the fact that these, these are literally garbage soils. I didn't think that there would be, uh, that they would be capable of supporting much um, biological function. But additionally, um, some earlier work by Groffman and Tiji um, showed that the higher the clay content of the soil, um, the more uh, that soil could sustain denitrification, high denitrification rates over a range of uh, flooding or saturation conditions. Um, so this is basically because uh, in clay soils, you have a lot more pore space that's capable of remaining uh, anaerobic, low oxygen. Um, and so even as the soil drains, um, those smaller pores are trapping the water in them and um, allowing the denitrifying bacteria to continue to uh, do their thing in a low oxygen environment. Um, a loam soil, which has lower clay content, um, starts to drop off in denitrification rate as um, the pores get filled more with air. Um, I didn't find that. <laughs> I actually found that the highest denitrification rates were in the fill piles, interestingly. Um, and I won't go into the chemistry of that too much, but basically, um, this, I, I suspect that that's because the fill, the fill piles had um, a soil that was capable of supporting both anaerobic and aerobic pore space. And so there was coupled denitrification, which made the uh, rates higher in those, in those garbage soils. Um, but this was very interesting. And it, it suggested that, um, that not only were uh, accidental wetlands potentially capable of supporting um, the process of denitrification, but potentially uh, their weird characteristics might make them even uh, more uniquely situated to provide that uh, kind of process. Um, I also did some spatial modeling at the site um, where I, we did a lot of soil sampling, uh, characterized texture, uh, drainage characteristics, and other sorts of things, um, took denitrification measurements along with those measurements, um, and then used the soil properties to predict where we might find hot spots of denitrification across the site. Um, I also digitized the uh, stormwater pass that traversed the site before going into Teaneck Creek, which is on the um, right-hand side of this photo. And um, you'll notice that these red spots are where we are, are finding the hot spots. Those uh, generally coincide with where the fill piles are, interestingly. And so if you do a calculation, uh, when I did an estimate of what whole site denitrification might be based on the uh, soil characteristics, it actually matched annual um, atmospheric deposition of nitrate. And 20% of the site um, had denitrification rates that were high, en high enough to remove all of the nitrate received from stormwater and the atmosphere. So it's doing a pretty good job, uh, even on a whole site basis. Um, these tiny little patches of garbage soil are, are actually uh, doing okay in terms of nitrate removal. Um, so this, so I, I, I uh, carried out similar studies at Liberty State Park, uh, which I showed in the previous slide. Um, Liberty State Park has a very interesting soil profile as well. Um, so again, this is a former train yard. Um, so what you have is a, a very, very uh, thick layer of highly compacted fill soils. And then sitting on top of that is this kind of um, railway rock uh, part of the profile. And then above that is where the, the plants are growing. The, the rooting depth is not terribly deep because these soils are so compacted. Um, 
So this showed something a little bit different. Um, I was comparing at the site uh, some patches of accidental wetlands, both in the forested areas and in um, these grass, marsh grass areas, um, to a constructed wetland at the same site um, where they had actually, uh, you know, manipulated water into to going into that part of the site. Um, they had done a major soil remediation, so they replaced contaminated soils with um, this like really nice loam soil and they planted all the plants there. Um, so if we compare the, the denitrification rates between the constructed uh, wetland and the accidental wetlands, um, it is much higher in the constructed wetland. Um, and if we look at those two products that I mentioned earlier of denitrification, N2 and N2O, you'll notice that um, the constructed wetland produced much more N2 relative to N2O than the accidental wetlands. So this suggests that uh, there might be some site by site differences. We can't uniformly say um, that accidental wetlands perform the same way as uh, maybe constructed or remnant or restored wetlands. Um, that was certainly the case in, in Liberty, um, but that might've had to do with the uh, fact that these soils were more compacted. Um, they're more contaminated with metals than, than the TNEC site. Um, so these could all be explanations. But I will say, in spite of that, um, the accidental, the rate of denitrification in the accidental wetlands did match atmospheric deposition of nitrate at the site. So it still is doing, these wetlands are still doing a pretty good job of removing nitrate. And um, the greenhouse gas emissions that they're producing are very, very negligible relative to other potential sources of N2O. So that is important to keep in mind. All right, so I'm going to uh, fly you across the country now um, to Phoenix, Arizona, um, where I did my postdoctoral work. And um, as I was trying to figure out uh, what am I going to do in Arizona, what, what, what is my new uh, sort of research project going to be there, um, I just started looking at aerial maps. That's what I always do when I'm trying to uh, come up with an interesting question to study. And I found some accidental wetlands in Phoenix too, which was really exciting. Um, so I was like, oh, this is, this, maybe this is a thing. Um, so to just give you a little bit of an explanation of where the accidental wetlands in Phoenix come from, um, this is an aerial view of Phoenix. Um, so this is Phoenix here. And if you squint a little bit, you can tell that, um, that this river traverses Phoenix, Arizona. This is called the Salt River. So the Salt River was uh, dammed into reservoirs um, upstream of the city in the mid 20th century. And um, afterwards, the bed of the Salt River has been uh, predominantly dry. There's, there's no upstream inputs from water that uh, the Salt River gets as soon as you hit Arizona. All of it is trapped in these reservoirs up here um, to feed the drinking water supply. But if we zoom into downtown Phoenix, You'll notice that the bed of the salt is uh, relatively dry, but there are these patches of, um, of water and patches of green as well in the bed of the Salt River. So that's what I initially noticed when I started looking at photos and uh, started looking into it more um, and found out that the, um, all of the water, uh, the stormwater system in Arizona um, ends up in the bed of the Salt River. So Phoenix doesn't get a whole lot of rain. It gets about eight inches on average of rain per year. Um, it's typically all in one of uh, two seasons, the summer monsoon or the winter rainy season. Um, but there is kind of a continuous source of water uh, through the stormwater pipes, what we call uh, urban base flow, which uh, I would love to research more. I'm trying to come up with some projects on that, but um, still a little bit of a mystery as to where this base flow is coming from. And that's kind of uh, what I'm interested in doing more work on. Um, but I suspect it's from things like industrial air conditioning, um, people emptying their pools, uh, irrig flood irrigation is a very common thing on lawns in, in Phoenix. Um, so there are some perennial wetlands uh, that the, the bed of the Salt River is supporting. Um, so I did some work looking at uh, nitrate removal in these accidental wetlands. So you can see, um, again, here's the bed of the Salt River. All of these wetlands are very linear um, because they're happening along a, a dry river bed. So here's the outfall here. This is the upstream area. This is the downstream area. So I was sampling for nitrate at both ends. 
Um, here's another accidental wetland in the bed of the salt. So here's a big outfall. It's running almost all the time. And um, here's the upstream area and downstream area that I sampled. So you can see in this site, um, this particular accidental wetland is very, very retentive. Um, if we look at the difference in nitrate uh, between the upstream and the downstream point, both during base flow and storm flow, um, you'll notice that close to 100% of that nitrate is removed between the upstream and downstream uh, point. Um, a little bit more variable in this accidental wetland. Um, so during base flow and storm flow, we see a wide range um, of removal. Uh, so unclear what's going on there. Um, probably has to do with uh, some very complex uh, spiral, like nutrient spiraling that's happening in this reach. Um, so um, I'm very interested in looking further into uh, how this gradient of intervention um, affects function. Um, so uh, my work primarily has been in accidental wetlands and then looking at maybe some um, constructed or restored wetlands as well in the past. Um, but now in New York, I um, have actually submitted a few proposals to expand this work out um, to look at a range of wetland types. So ranging all the way from remnant and accidental to restored and constructed. And the reason I think there might be differences is, um, you know, you have a, potentially a lot more design and management um, in restored and constructed wetlands, which may sort of narrow or limit the functions, particularly in constructed wetlands, um, because they haven't had a chance to um, self-organize. So these, um, I would argue that, sorry, that these wetlands here, um, because they have um, self-organized ecologically and potentially have less human disturbance because they're in areas of the landscape that are either abandoned in the case of accidental wetlands or maybe conserved in the case of remnant wetlands, there might actually be less uh, human disturbance there. And so there's some really interesting implications for uh, whether these types of wetlands would potentially be more functional and more ecologically intact than these wetlands. So uh, to be determined. Um, so I have had uh, some undergraduate students uh, do a few projects to try to start exploring this topic a little bit further. Um, so one of the sites is uh, in Newtown Creek, uh, where there's a lot of existing and planned green infrastructure uh, designed for stormwater management. Um, so lots of different types of green infrastructure being installed into uh, the watershed to figure out if, um, if we can decrease the amount of stormwater that is, uh, that's going into the creek. Um, and then in Coney Island Creek, there have been a number of different restored uh, environments. So there's um, a restored marsh area, there's a restored oyster reef, and then there's actually some accidental features in this system that uh, my student uh, Tashina Maxwell and I found, which is these large populations of self-established mussels. Um, so uh, we did a study where we uh, quantified the number of mussels and then tried to figure out how much uh, nitrogen removal they might be capable of. Um, so this work has very heavily relied on nitrogen budgets in New York City watersheds. Um, and I just wanted to show the, the three awesome undergraduate students that were responsible for this work. So in Coney Island Creek, um, again, where we, we have this sort of uh, accidental and self uh, sort of accidental self-established elements of the ecosystem and restored. Um, we find that uh, that inputs of nitrogen in the form of nitrate. Um, we're not quite sure about CSO inputs. We weren't able to characterize that, uh, but we were able to take some measurements by stormwater pipes and look at how much was coming in from the ocean um, in, uh, in the tidal cycle. Um, so these inputs are um, really not being matched by outputs. So even though we found um, almost a million uh, mussels in our surveys of the site, um, yes, I said a million, <laughs> there are a lot of mussels that are self-established in this site. Um, there's really not a lot of um, removal that they are capable of doing um, by our estimates. We didn't take actual measurements, we used literature values um, because COVID, drove me onto the computer and literature searches to do this research uh, the last couple of years. Um, 
So this is, uh, this is an interesting result because there is a goal in New York City of restoring a billion oysters um, to New York City waterways uh, called the Building Billion Oyster Project. And um, I think that we, we really need to utilize budgets to figure out how useful uh, the deployment of this uh, type of wetland infrastructure will be. Um, you know, there is a capability of removing nitrogen, perhaps. Um, but it is absolutely dwarfed by the inputs that are coming into the system. Um, similarly, in Newtown Creek, um, this is my student, Paris Baker, um, who did this work. Again, this is based on literature values and um, some spatial analysis. Um, but she calculated the nitrogen load um, that was coming into Newtown Creek, um, both in the presence of green infrastructure and in the absence of green infrastructure that had been put into the watershed. And um, maybe you can tell there's not a terrible lot of difference uh, between those two. Um, green infrastructure is really not doing a great job of mitigating uh, nitrogen. Um, and some of the, re I'll go into the reasons for that in more detail in just a bit. Um, but basically uh, a lot of the polluted water, a lot of the water that's polluted with nitrogen is actually bypassing green infrastructure. So there's not much of an offset that, that is happening. Um, due to the implementation of that. So this is really suggestive that, um, that maybe we need to be looking more into um, how we can utilize already existing parts of the landscape like accidental wetlands, um, as well as maybe implementing new infrastructure uh, to really get at uh, solving some of the problems that we're facing with nitrogen pollution. Um, so, Infrastructure is not necessarily the answer. We might have to take a, a more of a mixed approach. All right, so now I want to um, get more into uh, the services and disservices that I've uh, started studying um, in urban wetlands. And um, uh, when we're looking at the types of um, ecosystem services that urban wetlands provide, um, I've already mentioned nitrogen removal as being uh, the service that I was sort of most focused on in my early work. Um, they're also capable of removing pathogens and other contaminants, uh, again, providing wildlife uh, habitat and um, cooling functions. Um, but they do, of course, have some associated disservices. I already mentioned greenhouse gas production associated with nitrogen removal. Um, but with wildlife habitat comes maybe potentially unwanted species. Um, and with heat mitigation and flood control um, come some other uh, trade-offs that I'll discuss um, that have to do more with the social and political context in which the uh, wetlands are found. Um, so like I said, I've, I've already covered um, this service and disservice in greater detail. Um, I wanna talk a little bit more um, about some other services that I've, that I've started um, researching along with collaborators um, and to do that, I'm going to explain uh, a little bit more about the interactions between these different stressors that I brought up earlier in the talk. So um, urbanization and climate change really uh, have a very strong interaction effect in terms of increasing nutrient and pathogen loading to urban waterways. Um, so we see here a data set from uh, the Baltimore Ecosystem, LTER, where in urban watersheds, um, extreme climate conditions like a record drought followed by a tropical storm can really increase the amount of nitrogen export in various um, urban watersheds. Um, they, the urban watersheds don't seem to have the same capability as forested watersheds in um, buffering the, um, the outputs of, of nitrogen um, from the landscape. Um, because there is so much runoff in urban watersheds, and because during dry conditions, you have a buildup of materials on the landscape, if you have a prolonged buildup of materials on the landscape, uh, a very large storm event like this is going to export all of those to uh, the nearby waterway. Um, and because of all the impervious surfaces in urban watersheds, uh, that transport is not uh, buffered by anything as you would find in water, uh, the forested watersheds. Um, so many of you are probably familiar with this, but uh, it, on the East Coast and in the Northeast, especially um, this combined overflow system that we have for uh, directing our sewage to the treatment plant is a major source of water pollution. So during dry conditions, um, 
the sewage and the sewage water that's coming from uh, municipal uses um, and domestic uses is, um, is transported via gravity to a sewage treatment plant. But because the stormwater system is combined with the sewage treatment system, um, you have these two combined uh, during rain events. And so even very small amounts of rain um, can cause an overflow of outfall pipes into the nearby waterway. Um, I should mention that, uh, that this is not the kind of uh, treatment system that they have in Arizona and Phoenix. Um, in Phoenix and other newer cities in the US, they separate the, the sewage and stormwater system. So this is kind of a unique problem in the Northeast um, and on the East Coast. So, um, so the combined sewer overflow systems are um, a, a very major source of water pollution. Um, this is again work that was done by uh, one of my undergraduate students. Um, so you'll see that, that these sources of nitrogen that I was mentioning earlier in the talk, um, like pest, pet waste and fertilizer um, are not really major inputs to New, Newtown Creek. Um, treated wa wastewater makes up just over half of the nitrogen that's going into the creek annually. Um, and raw sewage from the combined sewer overflow system makes up um, just under half of the, of the remainder. Um, so uh, the, the reason that we're not uh, really seeing um, a lot of effect from implementing green infrastructure in the watershed is in part because the treated stormwater, uh, or sorry, the treated wastewater rather that's coming from the wastewater treatment plant is not going through these green infrastructures. Um, it's just going directly into the creek. Um, but also, uh, this is suggestive that the green infrastructure that has been implemented is nowhere near enough to um, offset uh, the stormwater going into the stormwater system and causing overflows. Um, so this is a monitoring data set that, um, that I found, or that I uh, collected, sorry, in Phoenix. Um, so up here, you have um, in blue discharge in the Salt River uh, wetlands that I just showed you. Um, and the precipitation record. So you can see that when it rains, um, that's when you get the most flooding in the river. Um, and if we look at both E. coli, um, a pathogen indicator um, in the pipes and the concentration of nitrate uh, relative to chloride, this is, um, I just put it relative to chloride so that we are correcting for the, a dilution effect um, when we have large amounts of water in the pipe. So, um, you can see that there's, this is a, actually a logarithmic scale. So you can see the massive pulsing um, of pathogens in the pipes um, after dry periods. Um, similar with nitrate, we see, we see these pulses of nitrate that are happening. Um, and the, pulse, the biggest pulses tend to coincide with when we've had a dry period previously. And so um, to go back to that original diagram that I was showing, um, in the Northeast, we really have um, some uh, potential issues with uh, extreme events like drought and hurricanes, as well as urban infrastructure um, and land change and land use that's happening in the watershed, um, really increasing the amount of pollution that's being exported to the watershed. Um, whereas in the Southwest, um, we, where we can also have drought, we also have these um, large rain events that can happen in the summer or sometimes in the winter. Um, again, in combination with infrastructure and uh, land change and land use um, that can really cause, um, if, if in the future we see an increase in um, extreme events, especially situated next to each other in time, um, we might get a, a really big increase in the pollution problems that we have already been experiencing in urban waterways. Um, I wanna point out also that a changing climate might mean um, wetland loss, uh, particularly in, in regions like the Southwest. So I mentioned before that the accidental wetlands in Phoenix are created by water that's basically wasted in the landscape, right? People are just um, watering their lawns or, or uh, you know, uh, draining their pools or you know, basically getting rid of the water in some way. But what happens in the future if there's more drought or there's a more insecure water supply and the city becomes more retentive of their water. They start using water saving practices that generate less wastewater. Well, that's good from a water supply perspective, um, but it might be taking wetland environments away altogether. So um, this is work that um, 
but my collaborator Amanda Suki did. Um, some of you may know Amanda, she was a postdoc here, um, but she was a PhD student in Arizona when I was there um, before she came here. And um, these are, uh, this is the precipitation record shown in red. And these lines here are various pipes that she was monitoring um, that, go, that feed into the Salt River and um, make accidental wetlands. So you can see that, that some of the pipes are flowing perennially through the year, no matter what is happening with precipitation. So this is probably uh, water that's being wasted by people um, throughout the year and just disposed of into the pipes and the stormwater system. Um, these pipes up here are really only running when it rains or um, sort of intermittently throughout the year. So we have a range of wetlands with a range of hydrologies uh, due to differences in human activities within that pipe shed. And this, um, has, uh, this actually resulted in some very different functions um, due to the different hydrology. So this is um, a paper that uh, Amanda and others published um, showing that uh, in comparison, uh, when, when comparing ephemeral, intermittent, and perennial uh, wetlands uh, in terms of denitrif denitrification potential, the perennial wetlands by far had the highest denitrification potential of these different wetland uh, types. Um, and uh, she took measurements also in non-vegetated and vegetative areas, which that's what the NV and V stand for. Um, she also found that um, the limitations to denitrification switched uh, between these different wetlands. So um, under this line is where uh, the denitrifiers are more limited by carbon uh, in denitrification. And this above the line is where they're more limited by nitrate. And you can see that the intermit uh, intermittent and perennial wetlands tend to be more limited by nitrate, whereas the ephemeral wetlands tend to be more limited by, um, by carbon. So this has some pretty important implications. Um, if, for example, again, in the future, um, the landscape bec becomes more retentive of water, or if there's prolonged drought, uh, which causes people to be less wasteful in their water use, uh, we could really lose not only uh, the ephemeral and intermittent wetlands altogether, um, but also have uh, less volume of water coming into the perennial wetlands which might mean major changes in function, a decrease in denitrification, and potentially a change in even what's driving denitrification in those wetlands. All right, so I, um, I want to now transition to uh, this more interdisciplinary work that I've been taking on um, since I got to PACE and started collaborating with my um, social scientist, uh, collaborator, and Tumi, um, where we've been looking at how uh, how we could potentially manage urban wetlands to assist vulnerable communities in particular um, in mitigating environmental stressors. Um, so a number of different cities uh, across the world uh, have people experiencing homelessness or um, low-income people who are very heavily reliant on wetland ecosystems and aquatic uh, ecosystems. And uh, this is certainly true in Phoenix where uh, this work really started for me. So um, this square is going to show up in a couple of maps in a row. Um, this is showing the, the urban core of Phoenix. You'll notice that, um, that the median household income in, the, in this sort of urban core area is quite low compared to the rest of the metro area. Um, and in this area, we also have a disproportionate amount of heat-related illness and death, um, which, of course, is going to be linked to poverty, especially in the Southwest, uh, because um, in, you know, what, what cools down the urban core is green to that people who are um, experiencing poverty can't afford to use their air conditioning as much, they can't afford, afford health care in the same way that the remainder of the city can. And so there are a lot of, of factors that are conspiring to this. Um, but what you'll also notice is that um, right through the urban core is where that dry, formerly dry bed of the Salt River flows um, and where we find the accidental wetlands. So to give you an idea of, um, of what it's like to be in a homeless shelter in Phoenix, this is an example of one that was actually shut down a couple of years ago. 
you'll notice no vegetation, um, not very aesthetically pleasing, a lot of concrete. Um, this is what the um, inhabitants are, are given in terms of uh, running water. Um, but just a couple of miles away from this exact shelter is the Salt River. So you can see how much more of a, an appeal this kind of environment would have uh, for people experiencing homelessness. And when I first started doing my work looking at nitrogen removal, um, I was always going very early in the morning and I would always find a little pile of something by the water. Um, this was in the middle of the summer. And I, it occurred to me, yeah, of course, like people, people are coming down here to sleep. It's, it's cooler here, it's nicer here. Um, so this really ignited my curiosity in, um, in how vulnerable people might be using uh, urban waterways differently and how they might be experiencing them differently. Um, so I did a number of studies with a team of social science collaborators in Arizona. And we found um, that indeed, uh, wetlands were providing a number of ecosystem services that were highly relevant to vulnerable populations, um, but maybe not as needed by the, the population of Phoenix as a whole. So um, heat mitigation, very important to people um, experiencing homelessness. Um, here you see a graph between uh, air temperature and water temperature. Um, the red area indicates where um, Phoenix calls a heat advisory. And unsurprisingly, uh, water temperature is always lower than air temperature at these sites. Not a surprise, that's how physics works. Um, but it does demonstrate that um, on average, these environments are um, likely much cooler. Um, we also did, uh, you saw in the previous slide, um, how pathogens uh, like spike to, uh, you know, orders like huge orders of magnitude, um, particularly after storms. Um, so uh, I was concerned about, you know, uh, the pathogen load in the river. We um, had some difficulty studying um, the, these particular groups of people because people experiencing homelessness are particularly vulnerable. There's disproportionate mental illness and drug use. Um, so we were only able to get a few interviews with people to confirm that they were actually coming into contact with the water, which they did confirm. Um, but we also did some trash surveys uh, where we were trying to discern use from trash items left behind at the sites and found that indeed there were a lot of um, trash items like soap, razors, toothbrushes that indicated that people were um, definitely coming into con skin contact if not ingesting the water coming out of the pipes. So this is potentially a really big problem. Um, so I've kind of continued this work in New York City um, with my collaborator and Tumi. Um, we've been doing some research in Coney Island Creek and just started on some research in the Harlem River. Um, and these are areas that are uh, very disproportionately diverse, um, impoverished, and, um, and uh, elderly uh, compared to the demographics of the city as a whole. So these are particularly vulnerable communities that are located adjacent to waterways and wetlands. Um, so the work that we've done recently uh, published in Local Environment, we have a couple of others pending, um, involved uh, similar kinds of signs of human use and also direct observations of people. Um, and what we found was that the community did have, a, a, did connect a strong cultural meaning and importance um, to the waterways that they were adjacent to. There were many uses that they had of these waterways and adjacent wetlands that put people into contact with the water. Um, some work that I've done um, where we're still working up the data set um, did indicate not only heavy pollution with nytrogen, um, but pathogens like crypt cryptosporidium, um, which we found both after rain events, but also um, during base flow conditions. And um, we've also interestingly found uh, some potential future threats to existing uses and meaning because of proposed infrastructure and development projects. So in Coney Island Creek, they're planning on putting in a ferry terminal that would just completely eliminate all of the current uses and meaning that the community has. Um, and in the Harlem River and in, in Sherman Creek, uh, they're planning on putting in this massive boathouse, which again would cut off people, um, would privatize basically a, a very large part of the site that people use as green space. Um, so a lot of uh, management and policy implications here. First, um, that urban wetlands, even those that are degraded um, very heavily um, and have not been restored or designed actually do support native wetland processes. Um, urban wetlands provide many functions and related services that can be, yes, highly variable over time and space um, and 
can and should be paired with just services. Um, and we've also found through this collaborative work that management goals for vulnerable populations might need to be substantially different. Um, so when we manage wetlands or restore them, um, who are we managing or restoring them for? That's a consideration that we have to take in. Um, so hopefully I have, um, I have sufficiently explained um, all of the arrows and boxes in this diagram and the connections between them. Um, I'm nearly out of time, um, but I wanted to quickly say that um, we do have some proposals in um, to expand, uh, expand the work that I've already been doing into um, more of a management and policy domain. So um, explicitly looking at planning processes and how they affect um, different types of hard infrastructure and ecological infrastructure and thus ecosystem services and disservices. So this is an NSF DICES proposal that we just put in. Um, and this is an NSF COPE uh, proposal that we just put in um, that merges a lot of different um, modeling efforts, um, both hydrologic, uh, social and ecosystem service and disservice models, um, pairing them with each other to really look at how we can better um, assist coastal communities, especially vulnerable communities in planning for future climate change. Um, so with that, I uh, have a ton of people to acknowledge. I won't read them all off, but um, thanks especially to my amazing undergraduate students. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Sorry, I went a little over. <laughs> um, so, so we have, again, we have about uh, 15 people here, we have 38 people online, and so we, we have questions and answers. And so those of you sitting online, good God, my thing. Um, sitting online, please put them in the, there's a Q&A or there's a chat, pre pre preferably put them in the Q&A and, and I'll go over those in a minute and, um, and, uh, and read some of those out. But are there questions here for the people here in the live audience? Questions for Monica? Winslow. So, what's the, um, the Western Pacific? You talked a lot about the project and the project and the project. Are there specific trade offs in those constructed wetlands between, say, doing treatments really well for nitrogen or like protecting the needs of the process from storm surges and so forth? That yeah, I definitely think so. Um, <clears throat> so some of the trade-offs that, that I've been looking at with, with my collaborator are between um, the, like more regulating ecosystem services like nitrogen removal or carbon storage, and then social um, or cultural ecosystem services, so uses and meanings. Um, so one trade-off that I can think of right off the top of my head is if you are, um, if you are trying to uh, if you're trying to sustain an area um, that has high biodiversity or has um, really good nitrogen removal, you probably don't want a lot of people walking through it all the time. Um, but that then that sort of precludes people from using it. So that would be that would be one trade off. Um, but there are other trade offs too. I mean, I, I think I showed in some of the studies how how much of a role um, hydrology plays in nitrogen removal, for example. And so um, you know, you, you kind of have to be um, very nuanced in, in how you regulate the hydrology for biogeochemical functions. And that may not be the best way to mitigate flooding. You know, if you're, if you're regulating it for denitrification, you might not be like preventing flooding as well as you could. So yeah, there, there are so many trade-offs that need to be considered. Yeah, I think that's a great, a great question. <laughs> yeah. Um, so could you repeat, so for the people that are virtual, we need to repeat the question. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Um, so the question was that there was a very high dinitrogen production in the constructed wetland relative to the accidental wetland. So what, what did I think was responsible for that? Um, the, okay, so, so the, the production of dinitrogen versus uh, nitrous oxide um, is like the, the difference is really caused by very minor differences in um, oxygen availability within the soil profile. Um, 
I think the reason that the constructed wetland had so much dinitrogen production was probably twofold. One, um, the water was slightly deeper um, in the constructed wetland and it was more perennial than in the accidental wetlands, which were a little bit more intermittent. Um, so there was more exposure to air and, um, and more oxygenation of the soil profile in the accidental wetlands relative to the constructed wetland. Um, I think also, um, even though I found really good denitrification rates in uh, the garbage piles at Teaneck, I think that the, the soils at Liberty, like I said, are, are a little bit different. They're more contaminated with heavy metals. And so that might've actually been uh, dampening uh, you know, microbial uh, function. Um, I don't know how that would relate to incomplete versus complete denitrification, but it might've played a role. Yeah. So there was a question from the chat and I'll, then I'll come to you, Evan. Um, <clears throat> Uh, it's related to this. So do you have any data on the microbial communities in, in any of these accidental wetlands? Um, I unfortunately don't. <laughs> um, I, I would love to, if someone wants to collaborate with me and, and characterize the microbial communities, that would be amazing. Um, but yeah, I, I think that's, that, that should be an area of research. I think that'd be so really I bet you that's what you're going to see in the difference between these constructed wetlands. Yeah. And these, traditional denitrifiers that can go all the way to N2, and then you're going to have a strange consortium of partial denitrifiers in the, mm -hmm. uh, I bet. Uh, yeah, good point. Um, the phenomenon of the accidental wetlands is fascinating. I was curious if, can you talk about the data on the migration of the research, or are those the results of like major infrastructure that were constructed? Um, yeah, so the I question, see, yeah, yeah, good. oh, sorry, the question was, um, are we continuing to create accidental wetlands or is this mostly kind of like a, a past sort of like this happened when the infrastructure was um, put in place um, and, and not since then? Um, yeah, I, I'm glad you asked that. I actually included a few slides because I thought I might get that question. So, um, so yeah, the answer is yes, we're creating new accidental wetlands all the time. Um, because the, the way that cities are managing water and the way that they're changing land use or abandoning parts of the land um, is constantly changing. We of course have shrinking cities, which are creating a lot of empty space in cities as well. Um, so that's a, a big opportunity for, um, for creation of accidental wetlands. Um, interestingly, uh, so I, I don't know if any of you are familiar with Nathan Kensinger's work. Um, he's a photojournalist that does a lot of um, photojournalism essays on New York City. I would really encourage you to read them. And I feel like Nathan Kinzer is finding a new accidental wetland for me every day uh, in New York City, um, which is, you know, uh, really cool. I mean, you, you basically go to parts of the landscape that no one is really paying attention to and, and you'll start to see them. Um, but Flushing, uh, Flushing Meadows is one place actually in New York City that is kind of slowly now becoming an accidental wetland system. So there's like, uh, because of sea level rise, there's actually like dry, dry weather flooding now um, that's semi-permanent. And so th these are some pictures again from, um, from Nathan's work, but you can see like um, this kind of wetland spot being created here in this, uh, in this abandoned parcel of land and birds are using it and there's vegetation coming in. So yeah, um, yeah. And, and honestly, like I, I say this all the time, but um, once you know about accidental wetlands, just you, you'll start noticing them everywhere when you're in a city. Um, it's something where you're just like, oh, that's a, that puddle of water, but it's actually, you know, if there's some plants growing in it, it's probably doing something ecologically. So, yeah. I just got, and we're, we're past 12 o'clock, but just, just, just one, one question. So this, this, this business of, of the accidental wetlands providing services to homeless people, and are we going to think about managing the accidental wetlands to facilitate that, or are we going to find places for people to live? Um, yeah, I, I think that uh, I think it's th those are two separate things. So um, I, I think that um, clearly, I, you know, not to get like political, but clearly <laughs> these communities are being underserved, right, by our, our existing system. Um, an ideal situation would be for them to be able to live a much better quality of life, period, you know, um, whatever that looks like. Um, I think that the, the problem is that in the, in the absence of those changes happening, 
and we should certainly be advocating for them. Um, people are using these landscapes. Um, and, and I'm not trying to posit that these are an alternative to other infrastructure, but I mean, in Coney Island Creek, for example, and in, in Sherman Creek in, in, um, in the Harlem River, um, those communities are not experiencing homelessness. You know, they, they, just let, they just have one green space available to them and they love that space, you know? Um, but I think that the answer is really complicated because these are also really contaminated dangerous spaces, right? So I think that, um, I don't think that the consideration, I, I think that they do need to be better managed to prevent harm from people because people wanna use them. So we should be mitigating harm um, either by posting signs or by cleaning these systems up or you know, whatever, uh, maybe doing some restoration. Um, but you know, it's, it's very complicated because, um, because improvements to a system like putting in a ferry terminal or restoring a marsh or putting in a boathouse which creates amenities and benefits for people can also cause gentrification, right? So, um, so I think it's 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 just a very uh, complicated thing. Yeah, I'm I'm definitely not saying uh, let's manage accidental wetlands better and uh, you know in, instead of like providing housing to people or something like that. Those those two aren't really alternatives. It just <laughs> raises a whole bunch of yeah. questions. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so we're past twelve o'clock. Um, if we have other questions, so Monica will be here for the rest of the day sitting in conference room two downstairs. And, um, and uh, we're gonna be, a couple of us are gonna be sitting there eating lunch. And, and so we're gonna spread out and, and eat lunch and shout at each other uh, while we eat our lunch. And, um, and if people wanna join in, come, 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 come certainly come and, and sit with us for lunch, or there's a couple of group meetings that people can come sit. Um, and there's an open slot at two o'clock. So if, if uh, um, people wanna meet, just come talk to me or, or come find us in, in conference room two downstairs in the building. And let's thank Monica for a great seminar. Thank you.